So this category is worth more than each of the others. It is often said that the Jessup is primarily a law competition as opposed to a speech competition. The principal purpose of the Jessup competition is to provide an environment for students to learn and apply public international law. In the same spirit, the Jessup values persuasion through logical presentation of the strongest legal arguments. While style and raw talent are often effective advocacy skills, the goal here is to teach students that in order to succeed as a lawyer, you must know the relevant law and you must know how to apply it. You should consider the following points when evaluating an oralist's knowledge of the law. The oralist should make clear, accurate statements of rules of law. This has two parts, clarity and accuracy. The oralist should be able to recite a clear rule, whether it be a holding from a case or rule of law derived from a general principles of international law or evidence of customer international law. The source or sources may not state the rule clearly, but the competitor should. The second component is accuracy. You will have the bench memorandum's analysis of the relevant cases, and that will help you determine whether the competitor is accurately citing the rule. The oralist should appropriately apply law to the facts of the case. After an oralist presents a rule of law, she should apply the rule to the facts of the compromise. Here is a good example. No, Your Excellency, and I will turn to my submissions on acquisitive prescription now to, deal, to deal with this issue. As was stated by this court in the case concerning Pedro Branca of 2008, the Temple of Pravaha and of 1962, and the Island of Palmas arbitration of 1928, title to a piece of territory to which an original title holder has lost possession due to the adverse possession of another state will only be transferred where there is acquiescence by that original title holder. Your Excellencies, the standard set within these cases for acquiescence is extremely high. In the case concerning Pedro Branca, the court required 100 years of silence on the part of Malaysia, plus an express denunciation of sovereignty, before it would hold that there had been an acquiescence by Malaysia. Furthermore, in the case concerning the Temple of Prayavaha, there was 47 years without response at all from Thailand before acquiescence was said to exist. Therefore, Your Excellencies, any silence on the part of a spatry between 1880 and 1910 does not manifest its acquiescence. And further, it has continuously and vociferously protested against the Rydelian occupation against its title. If the fact giving rise to the rule of law or the application of the rule is different than the factual scenario at hand, oralists should note such, such differences and be able to explain how and why the law is different and nonetheless still applicable. The oralist should know the basic facts and holdings of the cases cited. When an oralist references a case, she should be able to tell you the basic facts and the relevant holding of the case. She may give you this information of her own volition, but if she doesn't, it's a good idea to ask her. If it is a case that appears in the bench memorandum, then you will be able, able to gauge the accuracy and clarity with which the oralist summarizes the facts and holding. If it is a case with which you are not familiar, the oralist should be able to summarize the facts and the holding in such a way that enables you to understand what it was about and why it is relevant. The oralist should present the strongest legal arguments. The bench memo prioritizes the strongest arguments and often explains why weaker arguments are not advisable. The oralist should present her arguments in the most persuasive way possible and be strategic about which arguments she chooses to present. Remember that the sides of the case are not perfectly balanced and the strongest argument might not be the most convincing. You are judging the advocate's ability to present arguments and not the ultimate merit of her position. The oralist should distinguish unfavorable authorities. The respondent team 
will have more authorities to distinguish because, as the respondent, they should respond to the applicant's arguments by distinguishing the present case from the authorities cited or by showing that a countervailing authority should be favored instead. This video clip provides a good example of this. There are not, Your Excellency, and we would concede that there have been a number of decisions under the International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes that held that a bid application in those cases did not constitute an investment, notably the decision of Mahali and Sri Lanka of 2004, and again of FW Oil and Trinidad and Tobago in 2008. However, we would seek to distinguish these cases on the basis that in those cases, the host state had made explicit statements to the effect that they were not to be bound in the pre-investment bidding phase. We lack these statements in this case, so therefore we do not uh, submit that we do need to rely on these exit decisions and that they can be distinguished. You can make it just as challenging for the applicant to distinguish unfavorable authorities because you will have the bench memo and the respondent's written brief, which you may use to identify the respondent's argument. You may ask an applicant or a list to respond to an argument that the respondent made in its brief, or to arguments that you anticipate the respondent will make in its oral pleadings. Also, many countervailing authorities are discussed in the bench memo, so you may ask the applicant or the respondent, that case supports you, but what about this other case, equally on point, which does not?